بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. The uh, Sabah collection, as you are all aware of, is one of the most extensive collection of Islamic art in the, in the world. Organized chronologically as well as geographically, it reveals the art of history, or the history of art, and the land governed by seven centuries of Islamic rule, from Spain in the West to Indonesia in the East. Not only the works of Muslims, but also of the Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and others who live in these lands. The lecture series of Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyya is based on the collection but has been extended to include not only works of art and architecture, but also about the history, literature, and other fields of study that relate to the collect collection itself, as well as to related studies outside of the bounds of the seven centuries. The Sabah collection is not about the Islamic art alone. It includes a number of pieces from pre-Islamic history and ancient history as well. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Naman Ahuja, is the Dean of School of Arts and, Art and Aesthetics at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, where his research concentrates on Indian iconography and sculpture. It also includes temple, architecture, and sultanate period painting. He's an author, exhibition curator, and general editor of the prestigious Mark publication. He has also done research in the pre-modern societies with, uh, like ancient Godra, including tonight's lecture entitled Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Sheikh Hassan, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to be back here in Kuwait after about 11 years. And I have to say, it's extraordinary. It's so warm and so wonderful to be here with you. Your hospitality has left me absolutely floored. I am really very grateful to be here. So I was thinking about what to speak about, and I was invited to, I thought I'd first speak about the silver mask, which um, is an extraordinary piece which is lying here and has been the subject of some mind-bending research for the past five, seven years, and I had the privilege of being able to show it in an exhibition that I curated at the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels um, about 10 years ago. And ever since then, it has intrigued me so much that we decided that we are going to keep that as a secret and show it to you another day when I come back on some other time. <laughs> but for today, I thought I'd talk about red velvet instead. Mobility, manners, and material. As living without air conditioning and heaters becomes impossible for us, let us reflect for a while on the lives of those who did not live in concrete cities. The tents of the last grand garden dwellers who lived in the cultivated paradisiac river flows of India and Pakistan are lying preserved in the Rajput courts of Jaipur and Jodhpur. They are remarkable examples of the physical mobility of people Tented dwellings bring one community into contact with another, creating a space where change took place in the nature of the traveler as well as the people that the traveler came into contact with. Today's talk examines the story of one panel of red velvet from a Mughal or Rajput tent to see how it opens up an understanding of the mobility of material, the mobility of people, and also how it registers a shift in taste, 
which in turn is reflective of an aspirational mobility of class and custom and indicative of a certain kind of social change. So therefore the word manners in my title. About five years ago, we were in the midst of detailed discussions on curating a selection of objects from Indian museums to pair with objects that came from the rest of the world for an exhibition that was called India and the World. The British Museum was going to lend India a hundred objects to tell the history of the world through. And as the Indian curator, I was charged with the responsibility of finding another hundred objects or so, 120 objects, to match with the British ones, British Museum objects, to be able to look at the history of the world through an Indian perspective and to throw, show comparatively what was going on in the world by looking at something that was made in India at the same time. My co-curator and I were charged with bringing to bear a history that showed some of the sumptuousness of the courts of the world because they felt that the public always likes to see extravagance. Yet extravagance is not one of the most important aspects of telling a history of the world, I argued. Luxury and riches can be seen very differently by those viewing the culture from a dif different social class for whom that very object of splendor can be a marker of their oppression. Yet courtly culture, which preserved and codified the customs and etiquette of a civilization, held relevance for people, it earned their respect, and even if we disregard the achievement of creating fine art because we deem it simply luxurious, that history of its social relevance was important enough to use it to tell a civilizational history. I was intrigued by the National Museum of India's red velvet tent panel because I suspected it could be used to tell a richer history and I am delighted to share some of the journeys I have been able to make in my research with this tent. This is a portion of the same remarkable Mughal tent that lies in many other museums and collections of the world. Originally, this panel was part of a grand shamiana that was in the Tosha Khana of the Royal Collection of Jaipur, from where it was dispersed sometime before 1984. The tent panel that forms the central subject of today's talk belongs to the same set of tent panels which are also lying in the Calico Museum in Ahmedabad. Apart from what, what, what must remain still in the locked up stores of Jaipur, there are over 16 panels of this tent which are published. The National Museum's panel is about 2.63 meters high and it's therefore from one group amongst this tent panel, which are of the largest size. So they come in two sizes, and the largest ones are these 2.6 meter high panels. Mughal tents were portable cloth palaces. They were base camps for military campaigns, which occupied the Mughal rulers like Akbar, Shah Jahan, and Aurangzeb for exceptionally long times, periods in their lives. Tents were their royal homes away from home, Tents were places from where affairs of the state were conducted, where guests were received, and from where vast empires were administered. Tents had to be folded up, carried with an enormous retinue, and re-erected at a suitable place. It transpires that the actual homes of the Mughal emperors for 40% of their life was, in, was indeed the tented palace. And according to some very detailed calculations, the time that the emperor actually spent in tents versus the time that the emperor spent in the great red forts of Agra or Delhi or Fatehpur Sikri or Lahore is disproportionate. At least 40% of their lives were spent in tents. And there are lots of detailed numbers that I can give you. So the National Museum panel is closely comparable in dimensions to the panels now lying in the Metropolitan Museum in New York which, as Peter Andrews' research has shown, form part of the walls of an enclosure rather than its ceiling. Right? So they become the walls, which would have been approximately one meter lower in size than the ones that are at the V&A and at the National Museum, which are the taller ones. 
the Met, the National Museum pieces, are higher, th higher than the height of a person on horseback. And so the line of sight doesn't allow the person on horseback to be able to look into the tent. So they form the outer enclosure right, of the royal tent. The Met piece still carries traces of leather tabs at the back, strengthening the batten pockets that would have accommodated the supports that were used to erect it, while the inner lining, preserved in the example at the V&A, here we are, shows the most exquisite embroidered pink and red roses on a golden beige and green background. This is startling, because one would have imagined that red would have been the desired and more sumptuous interior. This makes these textiles an important indicator of moral taste and allows us to study the nature of their interior design. The palette and design changed quite dramatically a hundred years later, and although I won't have time to go into that detail, to go into that in any detail tonight, I'll show you a slide that will help reflect on at least one aspect of the shift in taste in about 100 years. When they were all together, these textiles, now scattered, must have formed the interior of a grand tented palace. The decor would have been of a series of arched niches in gold outline against a deep red velvet background, each containing a large floral spray derived from the motif of a poppy. Delicate and expensive velvet adorned with gold leaf does not, at first, appear to be a suitable material for external use. Incapable as it would have been to withstand dust and rain, how then has it survived? Was this only an ornamental tent, or was it actually a functioning tent? Abul Fazl's account in the Ayn-e Akbari, he was the chronicler and historian of the Mughal Emperor Akbar, is very informative. He clarifies, firstly, that there were essentially two main types of encampments, encampments, small ones used on short journeys and hunting parties, while the larger camps were like veritable townships that were intended for royal tours and military expeditions. Abul Fazl also tells us that the office of the tent manager was of such importance, and further, that red tents were reserved for the king and was always the most sumptuous one. Many further cloth walls and screens would have made up the whole tented encampment surrounding the royal tent. With carpets and mats pressing down and soaking up the dust, this red tent must have been inside the inner core of the tented township with miles of carpets around it. And that might explain how such a panel has survived. While talking about the camps made for expeditions, Abul Fazl writes that first, the Gulal Bar, or the Red Wall, is a great fence that is brought into use by the Lord of the World, meaning Akbar, the Emperor. Akbar regards, or the Lord of the World, he says, <laughs> regards this department as an excellent dwelling place, a shelter against heat and cold, a protection against rain, and an ornament for the Empire. And because he considers its decorativeness as part of the pomp of sovereignty, he accounts the care that is given to these tents as being equivalent to divine worship. Right? So those who look after the tents are considered to be performing a divine duty, according to Akbar. Um, he has, then Abul Fazl carries on, Akbar has increased the number of tents that were known the barga, the tent of state, can in the, can, in the largest cases, hold up to 10,000 people or more sitting in its shade. A thousand skilled tent pitchers erect such a tent in a week with the help of traction machines. Most have two main poles, surug, each of which is jointed together with several iron bands, the ahanjama, plain ones on which a cloth of gold and velvet and gold fringes are not used. These cost 10,000 rupees and more. The value of richly worked ones is beyond the limit of words. The price of other kinds is analogous to the former." Close quote. So we've got a detailed account from the Aini Akbari about the use of such tents. Tented dwellings have been used for millennia. And here is a plan that Peter Andrews has provided of the Urdu. 
the Urdu, as you must know, is the Mongol word for a tent. And the language that was spoken by the people who came together in these town tented townships therefore began to be known as the pidgin, as the language that was spoken in the Urdu, and therefore poetry is born in mobility, in migration, in the space of that mobility. It's just worth remembering that. So tented dwellings have been used for millennia, and few parts of the world can rival their rich history among Central Asian nomads, which includes the, Central, the Mughal ancestors, and the Arabian deserts. The type and nature of tents has changed over time. Bernard O'Kane says that the value of tents can be gauged from the way in which they were considered to be parts of treasuries. They were included in the dowry of one of Temur's wives. And, on the campaign, and, and when on campaign, Temur occasionally gave presents of tents to captured royalty or to generals who had distinguished themselves. The few references to contemporaneous tents in Sultanate times in India reveal that they were already using the red enclosure in the encampment for the ruler. So the idea of using the red tent in the center for the main ruler is something that had started already in Sultanate times. Such considerable investment in the preference to live in nature, enjoying the different climes, must of course go back to grand old Mongol and nomadic roots. It was, so import it was important to the many migratory communities of the world, the Rabadis, the Banjaras, the Bedouin too. Now about this tent, Peter Andrew states that the inside is decorated with cloth of gold and velvet and the outside with scarlet broadcloth surrounded with silken girth of webbing, Navari. This must have been the outer shell around a golden core. Accounts reveal that nearly 1,000 carpets covered the floor of just the divan e khas. Rougher carpets and mats would cover the dusty ground throughout. Not only was the paraphernalia of the office of the tent master enormous, the whole collection had to be duplicated. You had to have at least two tents and two sets of servants running the entire tented, tenting operation. One set, the pishkhana, needed to be sent on ahead and erected to wait the arrival of the emperor and his followers, while the one that had just been occupied was packed up to reach the subsequent destination. Right, because you were on the move. Each encampment required 100 elephants, 500 camels, 400 carts, 100 bearers, and 2,000 foot soldiers and laborers. Now times two, right? All of that in constant employment. When the army also traveled alongside, the size of this encampment was even larger. There were doctors, supplies, entire support services, bazaars, and of course the soldiers themselves. And as is to be expected, the township traversed no more than 16 kilometers a day. Right? So that was the speed at which the tent moved. The archaeological historian, Carla Sinipoli, elaborates on the planning of tented townships. She says, the imperial camp was constructed according to a formal plan described as a mobile version of Akbar's capital of Fatehpur Sikri. A large wall of cloth screens enclosed the royal camp forming an east-west oriented rectangle one and a half kilometers long approximately. The emperor's tent and royal reception areas were consistently placed in the center on the eastern end of the royal enclosure. This was the only two-storied tent in the imperial camp, enclosed within walls of distinctive scarlet cloth. Next to the emperor was a screened area containing the tents of the royal harem. Beyond this were enormous awnings for public and private royal audiences, Tents for nobles were aligned in carefully specified locations that spatially expressed their relations with the ruler. Beyond the royal enclosure were the tents of lesser nobles and the military, as well as administrative facilities, stables, arsenals, workshops of, attach of attached specialists, and kitchens. Merchants and moneylenders formed neat bazaar areas along the streets of the massive tent city. Live in it for a day or two, and then move on to the next one. The tented township, then, has brought us to the subject of urban planning. 
At the same time, research on tents makes us understand the ideas we now associate with vernacular architecture of ephemeral materials. Students are taught all too often in their lessons on art and architectural history that perishable antecedents provided the impetus to the building of permanent structures of stone. And here we can see how that was done, how the planning of those cities was organized. Can we then use the rich information that surrounds Mughal tentage to see how it might have inspired the buildings of the Mughals? Can it be equally true then that rather than the city of Fatehpur Sikri being the model for tented townships, it was the other way around? Where in centuries of spatial organization that had been learned through the erection and re-erection of tents in which emperors spent much of their lives, gave urban planners the much needed experience they required on how a city needed to be organized. Now this brings me to the issue of mobile sovereignty. Even though the tent was lavish, it also carried with it a capacity for allowing the emperor to be subject to the vagaries of weather, encounter new habitats, and people. And as much as we think of the, of the people coming to the court and being struck by the aura of the emperor, something which we see in page after page in the grand hierarchy of the paintings of Shah Jahan's Pacha Nama, we also need to remember that it was the king who parked himself in areas where he would receive ambassadors and kings. The tent strengthened the monarch's connection with his people and land. The grandeur of the royal tent is noted in nearly every ambassador's account to India. This opulence was deliberate. It made the necessary impact to maintain hierarchies. Shah Jahan's chronicler and Aurangzeb's teacher, Muhammad Saleh's description, makes clear that the imperial tent was spectacular and celestial. Its awesomeness apart, he further notes that the labor and mechanical devices used for its elevation and maintenance was also equally grand, a veritable performance and boastful prerogative of a mobile display of imperial power that could arrive if you were lucky just outside your land, and if you were not, within your territory and lay claim to your land. Right? The slow march of the mobile court had a huge impact on the artistic traditions and courtly etiquette of the people they encountered. Even more powerful, however, was the idea that the king could function from multiple capitals, not just Delhi, Agra, and Lahore, which were constructed of stone, but the mobile ones ensured that there were other functioning headquarters too, these notions of mobile sovereignty came down from Mongol times. Now, was this the case with the Rajputs as well? After all, the panel that we are examining comes from Jaipur. Zirvat Chaudhary has revealed how Jodhpur's ruler, Abhay Singh, who reigned from 1724 to 1749, emulated the Mughal tent and courtly culture to be able to assert his own authority. The interior of the tents was generally lined with a material different from the outside, which was red, a color, a color that was strictly guarded as royal privilege. So embedded was the Lal Dera, as it used to be called, in the public consciousness as a seat of power, that it served exactly the type of propaganda a Rajput ruler like Abhay Singh required after having come to power in less than honorable circumstances. The pomp and authority exerted by the Mughal tent provided the legitimacy that Abhay Singh wanted. Red tents were reserved for the royal enclosure, and this can be seen in the folio from the Babar Nama over here. They were the exclusive prerogative of the emperor throughout the Middle East since the Seljuk period. The panel at the National Museum may have been made as early as the reign of Raja Jai Singh of Jaipur, and Jai Singh the first ruled from 1611 to 1667. And I suspect that the tent panel that we are looking at was made in about 1660, approximately. It could also have been made by his successor, Raja Ram Singh the first, who reigned from 1667 to 1688 of Ambir, the city that later began to be known as Jaipur. 
The Jaipur court had a close association with the Mughals ever since the reign of Akbar, who forged an alliance with Raja Man Singh I, made him a general and a chosen minister. The families of Jaipur and the Mughals intermarried, and innumerable gifts, books, and carpets were exchanged between the two courts. The Mughals and Rajputs, it is known, had exceptionally close ties and were deeply interconnected through diplomacy and marriage and deep filial connections. Rajput cousins of Mughal princes would have grown up around them in these tented palaces. And so, moving from its form and function, we now come to a question about whether the present tent, which was found originally in the stores of the Palace of Jaipur, was a Rajput or a Mughal object. And further, how do we really date it? Well, we can date it, like most art historians do, on the basis of the material, the motif on it, and the color. The shade of red seen on this tent is carmine. In parts where it is well-preserved, the kanath is crimson, but in the parts that have faded, it looks a bit scarlet. This is offset by the, by the applied gold leaf. A study of multiple panels has shown that the gold leaf, which is varak, um, was burnished onto gum applied to the velvet in the shape of the pattern with the help of a wooden block or template, just as you would do on a wall when gilding a wall in putting a stencil and filling it with glue and then putting the gold leaf on it. The dye on a comparable textile from the same group was analyzed by the Textile Research Associates of New York in 1995, and it was found to be cochineal with some presence of lark, indicated by thin layer chromatography. Lark is a distinctly Indian ingredient, long used to dye cotton, but the presence of cochineal, which is an imported dye, is significant. Unlike madder, which is normally used for red, which is derived from a root, and ochre, which comes from a mineral, both lark and cochineal are derived from insects. American cochineal was introduced in Asia first in the 16th century. So we're talking about the mid late 1500s. This is an early example of the absorption of American trade in distinctive luxury materials like cochineal at the same time when items of personal adornment such as Colombian emeralds and plants like marigold flowers or tomatoes and potatoes and chilies entered India from the Americas, forever changing how Indians lived, how they ate, and the most essential flower that Indians used in a temple was forever changed, and it was now the marigold, which came from, again, the Americas. Extremely expensive, trade records show that attempts by English merchants to sell cochineal in India met with little success and was used only by the wealthiest Indians. Its extensive presence on the many surviving panels of this tent indicate that the velvet itself might have come from elsewhere, perhaps. Did the velvet even originate in India, or is it European velvet, rather than have been made locally? <coughs> There is a rich history of similar red shades of velvet used in the, in the European, especially Venetian context. Often dyed a deep red, it was used only for the most important royal and papal ranks. The history of silk velvet is closely tied with Ottoman velvets of about the same time between 1550 to 1650. Highly prized, the Ottoman velvets made their way to Hindustan at the same time. Peter Andrews quotes the famous Demurid historian, the author of the Humayun Nama, Ghiasuldin Khwandamir's account, where he records that in 1533, he saw a tent made of makhmal-e-farang, or European velvet, in the vicinity of Gwalior in Hindustan. But he also cites Sir Thomas Rowe, who was the English ambassador to India in 1615 to 1618, who mentioned that Venetian hangings of velvet with gold could be seen in the Zanana, or the ladies' quarters, in the court of Jahangir. Now, velvet, 
is, strictly speaking, in Indian languages, known as Makhmal, as opposed to Chanel, which is a different fabric. Makhmal e Badla Baf, Andrews mentions, or brocaded velvet, is a term distinctly Indian and not found in Arabic, Persian, or Turkish texts. Makhmal e Farang is also a term found in, widely in Indo Persian texts up to the end of Jahangir, up to the end of the reign of Jahangir, which refers to European velvets that were being imported. What makes matters confusing when reading the literature is that while several writers talk of expensive silks and brocaded embroidered ones being made in India, it is not always clear if they were unfamiliar with the specific words used for velvet, or are they talking about carpets which have a pile? The study of velvets should, technically speaking, be done alongside carpets since both use the technique of rendering a pile on a base warp and weft. Silk pile carpets were certainly made in India in the reign of Shah Jahan, again pointing to a naturalization of using a silk pile technique sometime toward the end of the first quarter of the 17th century. Pashmina pile carpets were made on a silk warp and weft, but silk pile carpets, although known, apparently did not become popular until the 18th century. It is not absolutely certain, therefore, if the cloth of the red velvet tent panels retrieved from the Jaipur Tosha Khana is Indian. As Andrew sums up, the velvet has been said to be possibly Dutch, and its ascription to Europe led Veronica Murphy of the V&A in 1982, when writing the catalogue called The Indian Heritage, to judge it as probably from the 18th century, citing the specialist opinion that it was unlikely to have ever been made before 1725. While at the same time, he notes that an argument for the European origin of the velvet was advanced, according to Rahul Jain, by Nabuko Kajitani, who was the former head of textiles at the Metropolitan Museum, based on the loom width and the presence of the red cochineal dye. However, Rahul Jain argues that these velvets are definitely Indian and they are not made somewhere else. Jain studied the group of the earliest known Indian velvets from the reign of Shah Jahan that are preserved in the Calico Museum in Ahmedabad for their stylistic features, structure, and technology. The stylistic features leave little doubt that the treatment of those velvets is distinctly Indian and Mughal and must have been made specially for the Mughal court. They therefore suggest that it is likely that the tradition of making silk velvets was naturalized in India sometime during the reign of Shah Jahan. Unlike the later Rajput red velvet, however, the early Shah Jahani pieces in the Calico Museum are all in soft shades of beige gold with raised cut irises, rather like a kilim with a bit of a raised pile um, structure that comes up periodically. Um, with, and it's these raised cut irises and other flowers in typical or distinctively Mughal style that we know of from 1635 to 1650. Similar floral patterns, such as the one in the Calico Museum's tent panels, are widespread and their occurrence on the walls in the paintings of the Pachanama is another piece of evidence. Every individual bud and blossom has been given attention in the Shah Jahani pieces. The leaves are less important than the flower, the stem is usually more erect than the gold poppy that we see in the tent panel from Jaipur, which is a little bit more squat. At first glance, it is obvious that the cusped arch with a poppy motif would be dated to the reign of Shah Jahan, because architectural historians know that these cusped arches came into the Mughal vocabulary from the reign of Shah Jahan. But they were also used after Shah Jahan. Dating textiles on the basis of an analysis of its style when compared with architecture and painting has to be done with great caution. Textiles have their own history and were oftentimes the place where techniques, ideas, and motifs were experimented on before they were committed to stone or even incorporated into official paintings. 
The presence of floral sprays in the arches can be seen as early as the 1590 painting in the harem tent in the famous V&A Akbar Nama painting of Akbar slaying animals in an enclosure on the occasion of the punishment that was meted out to Hamid Bakari. However, the arches in this tent are not cusped, as you can see over there. You'll see an arched spray of flowers, but there's no cusped arch. The flowers are in the nature of sprays of blossoms rather than a single plant that has been amplified, which is what we start seeing in Shah Jahan's time and after Shah Jahan, uh, where the style changed. By contrast, the depictions of red tent panels with the gold khadi flowers, in, which is the varak uh, flower, the Rajasthani word for that style is khadi, um, <clears throat> can be seen in the paintings of Maharana Ari Singh of Mewar in 1767, where we see a shift in the aesthetic of much more gold rather than the red. It's stuffed with gilt flowers and leaves, a style which tended to be emulated in the Rajput paintings of Kota from the early to mid 19th century. When discussing, you can see the shift in the interior design here. The red and gold khadi work velvet tent is become the inside and the white has come on the outside. Right. A complete shift has taken place. Um, when discussing comparable material from Kota, it seems the tradition only reached there sometime in the 18th century, as evidence for this cannot be seen in the Rajput paintings of Ari Singh or Sangram Singh. But it is no doubt made by a similar workshop to the one that produced the older Jaipur Toshakhana tent. Paintings from Kota show red being used inside the tent or palace. However, in the Jaipur paintings of 1830, they are shown outside as well. Could this Jaipur tent, which must originally have been vivid when it was first made in the reign of Raja Jai Singh, have faded so badly because it began to be used outside by his descendants? I think that's what probably happened to this tent. Indian velvets from the 19th century are widely preserved, invariably embroidered in the Badala technique found in almost all Indian royal collections. Given the differences in the qualities of velvet, material, technique, and style, there is no doubt the Jaipur velvet panels could not be as late as those and are likely to reign from the date of Aurangzeb or late in the reign of Shah Jahan, but made in Jaipur, where the king was Raja Ram Singh I, in about the 1660s, I would say. That would have been a period when cultural interconnections between the Mughal and Jaipur courts would have been prolific, craft technologies would have been shared widely, and it would have been a phase when Jaipur itself would have become a nodal point that lent the capacities of its many karkhanas to the other Rajput states. Little advance has been made in the scholarship on the actual working of the textile design studios, what was the payment made to workshops, what was the lot of weavers, or even how did they procure raw material at that time. It's not that the information about this does not exist, it's just that scholars haven't really looked at historical sources adequately. By contrast, years of research on the oeuvre of painters has finally yielded a turning point in scholarship that allows the scores of unsigned works that lie in our museums to be attributed to a particular painter's hand. It's linked with his, and sometimes her, biography. Their interactions with their patrons, the industry that supported them, the histories of the workshops and communities in which they worked, are now becoming so much better known to us. But a kanat such as this on luxurious velvet that either came from Europe or emulated European velvet in India, dyed with South American ingredients, decorated in gold in a pattern made popular by Shah Jahan but printed in the long-standing technique of Rajasthan, found in the storerooms of a Rajput king, enamored by the court customs of his Mughal emperors, encapsulates a rich history of India and the world. The early Mughal emperors and their courts were constantly on the move and spent 
almost as much time, as I said, in tented palaces as in the cities they founded. These ephemeral but lavish mobile palaces drew praise in the accounts of Mughal and, and European chroniclers. Apart from just the movement of materials and techniques that connected the world, in the exhibition, where you see this displayed, called India and the World, we wanted to show that courtly culture, manners, and etiquette are something that move with people and material. The absorption of this tent into a Rajput environment then reveals the aspiration to a new high culture through the type of interior decor, this fashion itself, and the style is thus a signifier of so much more than just a limited understanding of a copying of a style. It's about copying an entire etiquette, a lifestyle, a manner. It shows the adoption of a hierarchy, the desire for the possession of an identity. The intention of the gallery in which it was displayed was to show how complex these exchanges were and how cultures and traditions were adopted and adapted anew. Such transformations were not limited to or contained only within India. Near this tent panel were other artworks from the 16th and 17th century in the curatorial display, which captured equally rich stories. The celebrated German artist Dürer's famous etching of an Indian rhinoceros, which arrived in Lisbon as a gift from the Sultan of Gujarat. The sketch that was made by Rembrandt, who made a copy of a Mughal portrait of Shah Jahan and of Jahangir that you can see over here, while Jahangir himself is looking at a European painting of the Virgin Mary Madonna made in Europe. So Jahangir looks at European art while Rembrandt is looking at a Mughal painting and copying it. Um, so we were able to look, to look at all of these kinds of exchanges. There was a portrait of the African Ethiopian slave Malekambar from Ahmednagar, which revealed how his extraordinary skills, which were unappreciated in one country, were so valued in another that he became one of the most famous prime ministers of India. To make its point about the mobility of tradition and adoptions of identity, the gallery began with a painting from the Babar Nama, which I showed you a little while ago, that showed how the Emperor Babar wanted to impress the local rulers in the region of Kohat, uh, in the northwest frontier, um, by throwing them a feast in his red tent, while beside it was an example of the tent of this red tent panel itself, where people could see what those tented panels actually looked like. This tent, therefore, shows the cultural interconnections between the Mughals and the Rajputs, but it also shows how a cusp between courtly interior and the wider, and the wider outdoors was maintained. It forms a cusp between luxury and utilitarianism. And finally, it shows the importance of this mobility, not just in how one culture learned how to make velvets and carpets from another, but also the materials that were used, such as the dye, the lark, and cochineal, which came from, one, from insects native to two diametrically opposite ends of the earth, all brought together in this object, which is a symbol of, culture, of, of the culture of mobility. To conclude today's talk, I should say that, well, I titled the talk Red Velvet, Mobility, Manners, and Material, because it has led us to see what are the effects of mobility on culture, on forming new benchmarks, on how mobility creates new developments in language, and how, above all, it has led us to see that home, whether modest or palatial, can be set up anywhere. Lest we forget, mobility leads to identities anew. The Mongolian and Chagatai or Turkic word for a tented camp, as I said, is Ordo or Urdu, which is the standard and common term for the same tented encampments of Hindustan, where different people were forced to, to live cheek by jowl, and where a new language developed that was given the name Urdu, after the name of the camps in which it evolved. What can be a greater reminder of the richness of the intermixing of cultures, people, traditions, and identities than to get a sense of the circumstances in which the birth of a beautiful new language that expresses the confluence of cultures took place? Thank you. <laughs>